So that brings us to Jesse Ostrander. He is the director of the Plant Diagnostic Lab in the Department of Plant Pathology, and he's the lead diagnostician and an instructor for the Intro to Plant Path and Diseases of the Landscape course. He has a master's degree. Close it down then. Okay. I'll press it off. And I got to quiet someone. Um, he has a master's degree in plant path from Kansas State and has been with NDSU since 2013. And again, please keep your mics, your mics muted and I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse. Okay, hey, thank you for that introduction, Julie. Um, and thank you everyone for your interest in uh, grapes in general. Um, as the title suggests, I'm gonna touch on a lot of different things, but this talk is primarily based on uh, presentation I've given a couple of times for the North Dakota uh, Grape and Wine Association. And it really focuses uh, more so on diseases, um, but there's uh, some other things mentioned um, just to kind of touch on a lot of the big topics of what you're gonna need to know if you decide to grow grapes. Um, so the outline for my talk is I'm gonna talk about the big three diseases. Um, those include black rot, powdery mildew, and downy mildew. And if you grow any number of grapes, you're very likely to see potentially all three of those pathogens, um, especially uh, one or two of them. Um, for each one of those pathogens, I'm going to talk about the impact they can have on your grape growing, uh, the symptoms uh, that you might see on the plants, and some tips to identify which uh, pathogen you might be dealing with. And then I'll go over some uh, integrated pest management, talking about both the chemicals uh, fungicides uh, that you could apply and when and how to apply those as well as some cultural things that you can do um, outside of the chemical applications that could help um, manage those diseases. And then after I talk about those um, pathogens I'm going to touch on a few other um, diseases that are less um, less problematic and also less common. I'll also talk about some common arthropod pests very briefly just to kind of let you know um, of them and give you some resources um, for dealing with those beyond myself, and also touch on a few other disorders. Then very briefly, I'll talk about um, some cultivation tips, um, and then I'll answer any questions that you might have. So black rot, um, it's caused by a fungus, and that fungus's scientific name is Guignardia bidwelli. It's favored by warm weather, but it's still a threat in North Dakota, and that's not supposed to be a joke. Um, I do mean that it gets warm enough in the summers of North Dakota that you will see um, black rot. It often develops in combination with rainfall, and that's going to be a very uh, common repeating theme uh, with these three pathogens I'm going to talk about first. Um, they're all heavily dependent on relative humidity and rainfall. And so you can see um, some infected berries there on the left. And then um, I'll talk more about what we call mummies, but some mummy fruit is uh, displayed on the right in those photos. So the impact of black rot is that it can have up to a 100% yield loss. Um, that yield loss is going to be a combination of direct infection of the fruit, which again, you can see down there on the left, as well as just the impact overall on the plant's health as the leaves lose photosynthetic uh, surface area from the infections. And even the canes can develop cankers. And in some special cases, uh, all of the material up uh, distal from the roots from those infected cankers can become um, blighted, it can die due to the damage from the stem. Um, so this is a pathogen that can affect all above ground parts of the vine. It's not going to affect the bark or the old woody tissue, but any green stems, leaves, petioles, uh, and fruit are uh, susceptible to this pathogen. And it's easily considered the most important disease of North Dakota grapes. And I've gotten many samples of black rot over the years. Um, so I just showed you kind of almost compendia worthy, textbook worthy photos with examples of, um, of uh, ideal characteristics of infection. Uh, this photo is more so just to let you know what you might see if you were walking several feet away from a plant with an infection at many different stages. In the bottom right, you can see uh, another leaf that's 
pretty much uh, photo worthy for a compendia. But more towards the bottom left, we have some uh, lesions that are less developed. And kind of in the middle there, you have some leaves that have several lesions that have coalesced. And so they have more of a scorched appearance. You can also see some of the berries are just brown. And maybe from this distance, um, we wouldn't know necessarily what's wrong with them. We'd have to take a closer look. So if you're trying to identify um, which pathogen you have, black rot is somewhat easy to identify. Uh, it has wonderfully characteristic lesions that are, uh, when I talk uh, to intro to plant pathology, um, one of the earlier labs we have are general uh, characteristics of fungi versus bacteria. And this pathogen really produces um, ideal lesions or lesions highly characteristic, I should say, of a fungal pathogen. They have a light colored brown center, a dark border, they're um, well-defined. You can definitely easily distinguish where the lesion starts and stops. And with this pathogen in particular, if you look at the lesions closely, you can see a ring of little black spots. Um, and those little black spots are fruiting bodies of the pathogen. Uh, and I'll show you a cross-section of what those look like when we go over the disease life cycle in just a moment. On the fruit, uh, it's pretty easy to notice it on the green berries if you get close. The infection starts off as a small white um, dot, which then has kind of a, a bullseye appearance with a lighter brown uh, ring around that white dot, and then the berry will turn brown. As the entire berry becomes infected, they will shrivel up, kind of dry out, and they become uh, what's called mummies. Uh, there are some pathogens that can look similar especially on the fruit to uh, black rot. Um, I'm not gonna get heavily into these pathogens right now, but two of them are botrytis, which are shown up at the top. So you can see the fruit will get a darkened and shriveled, ap shriveled appearance similar uh, to black rot. And also anthracnose will uh, cause the fruit to turn um, darker in color. Um, Botrytis, uh, I could tell the difference between botrytis and black rot right away because you might notice on the far right there, um, it's not the highest resolution image, but the uh, pathogen is producing some spores that make the fruit look fuzzy. And so black rot does not produce a fuzzy um, appearance on the fruit. And Dracnose has um, a, a reddish coloration to it also that you will not see with black rot. So if we look at the life cycle of black rot, um, I wanna start in the upper left where you can see that mummified fruit containing fruiting bodies. And so that mummified fruit is very important because that's how the pathogen survives the winter and it's uh, the source of the infection for the next year, uh, at least the source in your own growing, um, your own growing conditions. Uh, so if we look really closely, that uh, at a cross section of that mummified fruit, we can see these little cavities called parathesia. And within that, those cavities, there are sacs filled with spores. And so those spores, when they're released in the spring, they're what we call the primary inoculum or the, the first source of disease. And so those are going to uh, uh, in, infect the leaves. And then the leaf tissue, I'm sorry about that. Um, the leaf tissue is going to uh, produce a different type of fruiting body uh, called a pycnidium. And so once those pycnidium are producing um, canidia, we can see there's a circular life cycle there. Uh, it doesn't look much like a circle in this picture, but the canidia are produced on leaves. They can infect new leaves or fruit. In turn, those are gonna produce more pycnidia with more spores to infect more leaves and more fruit. And so that's where the damage really takes place, but we're not able to prevent that um, cycle if we don't get rid of those mummified fruit. To some degree, even if you were to uh, remove all sources of primary inoculum, uh, there's still a chance that those canidia could blow in from a neighboring vineyard or a, neighbor, a neighbor's grapevine. However, that infection would take place later in the season um, and your plants would be more robust and better able to handle um, that later uh, introduction of the pathogen, as opposed to if you have a large number of mummies in your own growing conditions. So for cultural management, 
You're going to clean up those mummies as best you can. That's absolutely vital to lower the disease pressure. Um, if you do see black rot uh, in the growing season, try and remove the infected portions of the plant. It will prevent all of those conidia from being released. And if you prune the plant properly, you can open it up and promote good airflow. That's going to reduce the microclimate of humidity inside of the vine and uh, lessen the ability of the fungus to continue to develop. Um, regarding chemical control, there is a critical time that you need to try and to protect those uh, plants. You're going to protect young fruit from pre-bloom until about four weeks post-bloom. Of course, that time is going to be a little bit different every year, so you're just going to have to get out there and know at what stage your plants are at to know when to apply uh, fungicides. Um, unfortunately, organic products and um, such as copper and sulfur are not very effective for this pathogen. Um, and the reason for that is that they just don't persist on the surface of the leaf and they don't enter the plant. So they're not, the fungus, most of it is down inside of the plant. Um, and then new infections are constantly occurring, new spores are constantly landing everywhere on the plant. So even if you were to spray uh, a copper solution on the plant, it's gonna get washed off very quickly. It's not gonna remain there and be effective. So you don't need to write any of this down or try to remember this table. Um, this table was taken from a guide uh, that I'm going to share with you, a link to this. Uh, it's called the Midwest Fruit and Pest Management Guide. It's released um, from Purdue, but it's a collaboration of, oh, I want to say 10 or more different universities, land-grant universities in the Midwest. Um, and it has these chemicals and more listed in there. Uh, I did list these chemicals because all of these um, have no documented cases of resistance occurring, so they're all highly effective. Um, <clears throat> and Mancozeb up there that starred is the recommended protectant, uh, whereas Captan, so there's two protectants on here. Protectants just remain on the surface of a plant. They don't enter into the plant's tissues, so they're really a preventive um, spray, so you could start out the season with a preventative spray. And then later in the season, if you do see any disease, you'd have to switch to a systemic because they enter the plant's tissues and then can actually interact with the existing fungus. Um, but Manclozeb is the recommended protectant. It's more effective than Captan, although both are listed as options. Um, so when you're applying protectants, um, you need to apply those every seven to 10 days. You're gonna aim more for seven if it's especially hot or wet, um, 10 days under ideal conditions, because even these protectants can eventually be washed off of the plants. And as the plant continues growing, uh, the new tissue will not have any protectants on it. Whereas systemics will move through the uh, water, um, the vascular tissues, and they will move into the new tissues to some degree. Uh, your best bet for controlling this disease is combining those cultural, um, those cultural practices of removing mummies and opening up the plant with proper pruning along with chemical. Uh, and then when you do the chemical, you're going to want to incorporate both a systemic and a protectant fungicide to get adequate control. Also, rotating modes of action for the systemics. All your systemic, um, there's a... Uh, organization called FRAC, the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, and they have assigned a, a mode of action group to every systemic fungicide. That'll be listed on that fungicide, and you're going to want to rotate into different modes of action. Even if a fungicide has a different name, you could have two, uh, act, two fungicides with different active ingredients that target the same site in a cell. And so with the FRAC action groups, are uh, separating fungicides out by which target site in a cell uh, they're actually acting on. And that's what we actually need to be rotating is which target site and cell is, uh, which, which, what is the target? Um, because if the fungus was to have a mutation and have a different uh, expressed target site, then all of those products uh, aimed at that target site would no longer be as effective. Um, so that's it for black rot. I do want to touch on that since I've already mentioned this. Um, there's not really an ideal place to talk about this, but when I did talk to the North Dakota uh, Wine and Grape Association, I brought this up and um, 
I ask them because I help a lot of different uh, commodity groups with, um, with disease uh, management issues. And one of the things that people have complained about is, you know, especially if you're doing uh, professional pesticide applications, um, a lot of these products, it's not like a little bottle that you're going to find at Home Depot. They're going to be big jugs that can do sometimes many thousands of acres uh, and they're expensive. And so what people tend to want to do is they might buy a case of uh, metconazole or a fungicide with metconazole as an active ingredient. And they want to use that up because it's not realistic that they're going to, um, to rotate and use, you know, one thousandth of that jug twice a year, right? If they're, if they're rotating to all these different fungicides. So to make it more economically friendly, uh, one thing that if, if you really get into grape growing, you could do is maybe start a Facebook group. And as part of that um, social interaction, you could uh, share your different fungicides. So one person could buy one mode of action and another person could buy a di different one and you guys could exchange those. Um, it, it's something that uh, that uh, association, I believe they have done. I know other groups have done that in the past. So if, you, if, you're, um, if your actual area that needs treated is pretty small. Um, so that's it for black rot. Um, if you can think of any good questions, I'll be happy to answer those at the end. Uh, moving on to powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is caused by a fungus as well, Erysiphe necator. Um, it really needs the relative humidity to be pretty high, even just to keep its activity going, not just for infection, but for actually uh, maintaining bioactive. Uh, and that's because um, the thallus or the body of the fungus is outside of the plant's host tissue. And that's actually why rainfall can be detrimental as well. The physical, um, the, the rain physically hitting the thallus of the fungus can actually damage it. Uh, powdery mildew can result in a yield loss of up to 100%. Um, it's, it's not going to really ever kill your plant. Um, powdery mildew can be a stress, an added level of stress that combined with other things like uh, poor fertility, inadequate water, um, detrimental weather conditions could, um, could overall kill a plant, but powdery mildew alone is not going to kill um, a grape plant or really any other plant. Powdery mildew is what we call a, uh, an obligate parasite. It cannot live off of a host, a living host, and because of that, it's very good at keeping that host alive, but it does result in yield loss because it will directly colonize berries, and when it does so, well, first of all, I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat a berry covered with uh, powdery mildew, but also it does a lot of mechanical damage um, by the way that it feeds on the berries. It's puncturing it, it's covering it with holes uh, to basically put the fungal equivalent of roots, feeding roots into that berry, and that's going to result in um, the berry shriveling up. So it can affect any green tissue and the fruit. Um, it's a very common pathogen and you probably see, you know, if you have any level of uh, active gardening, uh, you probably see powdery mildew. It affects many trees, turf, peonies are always um, getting covered with powdery mildew, especially if they're in the shade part of the day. I know begonias have a huge problem with this and all of those plants, that species of powdery mildew is specific to that plant. So the species of powdery mildew you're going to see on your grapes will not affect the other plants in your um, in your yard. So you can actually manage powdery mildew on grapes just by sp spraying the grape plants. You don't need to spray any other plant in your yard or in the vicinity that might have powdery mildew. Um, it does originally colonize the lower leaf surface, but then it will move to the uh, upper leaf surface is where it's going to sporulate. Uh, it has an optimal range from 70 degrees to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, but the fungus can actually infect and it will have some activity uh, as long as it's warmer than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's a photo showing early infection. Uh, and in this particular case, we do see some of that characteristic powdery uh, growth there. Uh, imagine if that weren't there, if you just saw those chlorotic spots, that's really what you're looking for is the first signs of infection potentially. And then later those infection spots will uh, result in that growth on the upper surface of the leaf. And as I had mentioned, it can infect the berries as well. Um, 
obviously it's doing a much better job of keeping that tissue alive compared to black rot, but you're not gonna wanna eat that. And after a few days, those berries are gonna start to shrivel as that fungus pulls nutrients and water out of those berries to uh, keep itself alive. So what are you actually seeing when you see that white powdery growth? Um, as I mentioned, the fungus is almost entirely external. Uh, and what you're seeing is that white coloring is mostly due to sporulation and somewhat to hypey. So if we see that, if we look at this textbook photo here at the bottom, there's really three different things that we're gonna be able to see on the plant that are showcased here. Uh, one is just the general mycelia. That's all the network of, um, of threads along the bottom of the photo. The other that you're gonna see most of the year are these, uh, these both clear and darkened spike-like structures. Those are the spores, the primary method that the uh, fungus spreads throughout the year called conidia. And then we have those meatball looking structures and those are the overwintering structures. And if you do look closely at powdery mildew infected tissue, you can see, uh, those are called Cleistothesia. You can see some Cleistothesia but those are gonna occur later in summer or early fall. And so here's actually a photo of a, um, a leaf with Chrysothesia. Um, and you can see uh, some of them almost look white. And then as they start to mature, they'll turn kind of a light brown. And then finally, they're a dark brown. Um, that dark color protects the spores from UV light. And um, just kind of a, I'm a bit of a microbiology nerd here. I, I get excited about fungal identification. Um, as a cool activity, you can um, look at each one of those Chrysothesia. You might notice the spikes coming off of them. They always make me think of the old naval mines that are floating just below the surface of the water. Uh, by looking at the ornamentation at the end of those spikes and also cracking open one of the Chrysothesia and counting the spores inside of them, you can identify the powdery mildew to uh, genus. Of course, you don't really need to do that if you know which species of plant it's on, uh, since they're all so highly host specific. But it's still a fun exercise, um, an easy introductory level taxonomy. So if we look at the um, life cycle of powdery mildew, um, I, we're going to kind of start with that meatball like Cleistothesium in the, at the top there. So those are going to crack open the next spring and they're going to release spores. And those spores are going to be able to colonize the surface of leaves. And um, when you look at that photo of the spore colonizing the leaves, you'll notice most of it stays up top, but there's that little um, indentation into the plant cell. So that's called a feeding structure called a hostorium. And uh, basically acts as like a plant's root does. It's just going to pull water and nutrients out of that plant cell, similar to how a plant root does that to soil. Um, they're going to put many thousands of those into each plant cell though. And so that uh, fungus will then uh, grow in biomass. It can directly infect grape clusters, which are going to produce more Chrysothesia, uh, and then, I'm sorry, more conidia. And also there will be more conidia formed on leaf surfaces. And then at the end of the year, uh, the fungus is going into the growing season. The fungus is going to survive by way of producing new Chrysothesia on uh, infected leaf tissue. And it can also survive in uh, dormant buds. Uh, the following season, if you follow the outermost uh, pathway at the top, um, the, out the following season, in addition to those Chrysothesia releasing spores, you'll also see as that dormant bud germinates, um, it'll give rise to a young shoot that will be completely covered by the fungus, which is kind of cool looking from a pathology standpoint, but it's really bad news for that plant. That's a ton of new inoculum. So if you see anything like that, you're going to want, you're going to, want to remove it um, from the vine. So regarding management, all cultivars are susceptible, um, but properly pruning and training the vine is going to help open it up and reduce that humidity that the fungus needs because again, it's almost entirely outside of the plant. So it's fairly susceptible to uh, dehydration, to drying out in low humidity environments. So removing the leaves around berry clusters immediately after fruit set is gonna help open up those berry clusters and reduce the, um, the microclimate that will allow that fungus to develop. Um, and if you do decide to uh, apply fungicides, um, you're gonna want to do so when temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So recall, even though it has an optimal temperature of 70 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, it does have some level of activity at 50 degrees or warmer. And so that fruit is highly susceptible for one month after bloom, uh, after which as the fruit continues to mature, it becomes less susceptible. And even if the fruit isn't directly uh, infected, just the uh, nutrients being sapped from the leaves and uh, of the plant are going to, could actually, I should say, could uh, stress the plant and reduce the quality of the fruit. So it's not just about direct infection, but of course, direct infection is going to be especially detrimental. Um, again, there's a list of uh, products here that you don't necessarily need to write down or try to remember because they're all going to be available for you in the Midwest uh, Fruit Management Guide. Um, but I did want to just touch on the fact that in this particular case, sulfur and potassium salts are actually um, listed as effective. And that's because that sulfur is going to be able to come in direct contact with that fungal tissue and uh, kill it because it's on the outside of the leaf. Um, however, with, uh, with the sulfur, you're going to want to be careful. Um, even if you've applied sulfur in the past, if you get a product in a new formulation, um, the application rates can change drastically. And sulfur can be quite damaging to plant tissue as well. So young leaves that haven't developed a good cuticle could be uh, quite damaged by sulfur. Or if you put it on at too strong of a rate, you could damage a leaf of any, at any uh, level of maturity. Um, and potassium salts, um, they can knock back infections, but they do absolutely nothing uh, to prevent an infection in the first place. And remember, these, uh, the spores are actually infecting from the underside of the leaf, which is going to be quite difficult um, to cover with a topical. So those systemics that are listed in there are going to help prevent infections as well as kick back existing. But that being said, I'm a you know, I'm all for promoting um, things that are more natural if they're effective, but we need to make sure that they're effective. So in this case, sulfur and potassium salts are. Um, so this is basically what I just talked about. There, you can have a dry flowable, a flowable, a wettable powder, or a dust. That's what the D, F, F, W, P, and D stand for. Um, you're going to have drastic different rates of application for each one of those formulations. So you're really going to want to read the label closely. Uh, if you've had experience with you know, dust uh, in the past, and then you find a wettable powder, uh, don't presume that it's the same uh, rates there. You could damage your plant or waste your time if you put it on to, uh, like, at not a high enough rate. Um, and as I mentioned with the potassium salts, they'll kick back an existing colony, but they don't prevent establishment, and they don't work for other pathogens either. So if you do happen to have um, powdery mildew and black rot, for example, uh, it'd be really in your best interest to find something that could be effective with, with um, both of those pathogens uh, rather than do something like potassium salts, which would not do anything to help manage black rot. Uh, so again, that's it for uh, powdery mildew. Um, downy mildew, um, this is the coolest looking pathogen that there is in the field of plant pathology. It's kind of beautiful, although obviously it's uh, not something you want to see if you're trying to get a good grape harvest. Um, <clears throat> it's called by, caused by an oomycete, uh, which is a fungal-like organism, but does have some biochemical differences that I'll touch on when we talk about management that are important. Uh, and its scientific name is Plasmopara viticola. And it's favored by, not surprisingly, warm and humid weather. <laughs> Um, downy mildew can affect all green parts of a vine, and the potential exists for complete defoliation on susceptible cultivars. Um, it's really more of the plant's fault. Uh, downy mildew is um, a, an obligate parasite, uh, similar to uh, powdery mildew, um, but when a plant can sense that a leaf is infected, it will drop that leaf. Um, infections start off as kind of a general, um, somewhat diffuse but circular uh, bruised looking area that's chlorotic, and that's what's shown on the left side. And then as the, um, as the infection progresses, those infected areas will turn uh, more necrotic and they'll become harshly angular. If we look at the underside of a leaf, um, that's where you're going to uh, see 
the pathogen sporulating. And uh, sometimes people confuse this with powdery mildew, uh, understandably. Um, it's usually a bit more circular though, and it's also going to primarily be on the underside of the leaf as opposed to the top of the leaf. Uh, it can affect berries as well. Um, and as uh, plants mature, which or as berries mature, I should say, if you look at that lower left photo, you can see the pathogen, uh, well, maybe you don't see it doing this, but what it's doing, if you follow it from the berry cluster back um, to that larger pedicle, um, it's actually traveling, the pathogen is spreading mechanically down that, <coughs> uh, down that tissue. And so as the berries mature, they become less susceptible to infection by spores, but at all growth stages, they are susceptible to direct infection uh, through the pathogens uh, migrating uh, through new tissue in the plant. And so when the berries do become infected, um, you know, it's obviously bad news there. They're very small in size and eventually they will become brown and die. Um, so here again is just a better um, example of the damage that you can see um, from infected berry clusters. So obviously that's going to really uh, impact your harvest. Um, so the white that you're seeing is actually um, the, the fruiting bodies of Plasmopara. Um, they're called sporangiophores. That's what the whole tree-like structure is called. And those little round clusters at the ends are called sporangia. Um, so this pathogen requires wet weather because those sporangia are actually filled with animal-like little spores that can swim through water. So they don't move in the wind like other fungi do. Uh, primarily they, they swim in waters, but they can explode very quickly if it gets wet. Um, they are highly prolific in the amount of spores that they make. So if you have a heavy rain event, you can go from a small amount of infection and then boom, you can just see it everywhere. Um, it does survive the winter and fall in infected leaf tissue. And the infection will begin when shoots are about eight inches long. So you're gonna want to um, apply any uh, protectant fungicides or uh, omicides uh, shortly before that. Uh, again, temperature is around 50 degrees. And as I mentioned, um, with it being able to uh, expand the level of disease quite quickly, it can infect a new, um, a new part of a plant or a new plant and then uh, produce spores to infect, uh, continue that infection as little as five days. So here's the life cycle of um, downy mildew. And if we want to start in the upper left, where we see a cross section of a leaf, um, it produces an overwintering structure called an O-spore. And that O-spore actually, similar to the fungus, uh, fungus's repeating cycle, will produce a uh, sporangium, which will then open up and release those little weird looking spores there, but those little, uh, little leg-like structures coming off of them are actually flagella that allow them to swim um, in water. And so from there, they will just uh, infect leaf and berries. And if you look at one of those close-ups of infected leaf or berry, you'll see um, out of the stomata, so the, the pores for gas exchange in the leaves, the fungus will produce that uh, sporangium, or the sporangia for with several sporangia. Um, and also it's a good opportunity to showcase the differences here. Um, behind that sporangium is inside the host tissue, you can see the discoloration representing the body of the omacota. Um, so if you were to apply something like a, a sulfur for this pathogen, it wouldn't come into contact with the fungus without killing the plant as well, since the fungus is up inside of the plant tissue. So what can you do? Um, well, again, um, for all three of these pathogens, um, it becomes rather uh, repetitive, but it is important. Um, properly selecting a site with good airflow and then training the vine correctly and uh, selectively pruning the canopy to open it up is going to do a lot of good. Um, mulching around the plant is, is a new one, though. Uh, the mulch actually will help in heavy rainstorms. The mulch will 
um, stop as much water from directly hitting the soil and bouncing up on the plant, which can actually uh, spread uh, spores, especially from any O spores that have um, persisted in the soil from previous year's infections. They can produce sporangia, which will then splash up onto the plant. But if you put down mulch, uh, it'll act as a barrier for that. Um, you're going to want to eliminate suckers and other green foliage at the ground level, similarly because those low-lying uh, tissues are going to be an easy uh, way for downy mildew to become established. And then destroy any uh, nearby secondary hosts. Um, so this would be like volunteers and things like that. And then just cleaning up debris will help prevent um, as many O spores from becoming persistent um, in the environment. Uh, I confess I don't know specifically for downy mildew, but in general and other O mycota, or other O mycota, uh, those O spores can persist up past 20 years. So once <clears throat> once you have uh, this pathogen producing those overwintering spores, you know it's going to be something that you have to think about managing pretty much indefinitely at that point. Uh, but cleaning up those debris and preventing those O spores from becoming incorporated with the soil environment is going to go a long way. Um, to alleviating disease pressure. And so all of these um, are practical in aiding, the, in aiding the reduction of infection or disease pressure, but fungicides are still gonna be recommended. Um, again, you don't have to remember this, but I do have it mostly as a talking point to remind myself, um, there are several products that will um, effectively manage uh, downy mildew but do not have good efficacy against fun, fungi and vice versa. So um, the primary way that uh, Omicota differ from fungi is they have different fats and a whole different uh, enzyme pathway to create those cell wall, uh, I'm sorry, so they have different fats and different uh, sterols. Like we have cholesterol, plants have sterols too, right? Uh, they have different sterols in their cell wall. And a lot of fungicides actually attack the enzyme pathway that creates those sterols, uh, and those won't work on uh, Omicota. But there are some products that are specific to Omicota that work on them and do not work on fungus, fungi. So just keep that in mind um, if you do ever uh, have to manage both um, a, a fungal pathogen and a Omicota, uh, uh, because you will um, not necessarily have overlap in all of the uh, different products available to you. I'm um, just going to mention real quick botrytis. Botrytis is a terrible uh, problem in greenhouses and anywhere where it remains wet. Um, and grape clusters <laughs> are another place where botrytis really thrives. Um, and you can again see a slightly better resolution photo here. You can kind of see that fuzzy, gritty uh, collection of spores. Um, that are really characteristic of Botrytis. Um, botrytis can overwinter and infect the debris on the ground or in the vine. Um, unlike the other pathogens we've talked about, Botrytis is what we call a saprophyte, or it likes to uh, infect and feed off of dead tissue. <clears throat> and so it, it's not, it's more of an opportunistic pathogen. It won't directly infect a, a healthy host, but if the host becomes damaged, or the tissues are senescing. Um, so if there's wounds from bird activity or hail, or even an infection scar from a powdery mildew infection, the triads can take advantage of that and infect the plant. I do apologize, I'm kind of losing my voice. All right, and its optimum temperature is uh, a little bit on the warmer side, I suppose, um, from 60 to 80 degrees with moisture. So there again is a somewhat blurry, but close up of a berry with botrytis. Um, so, you know, without those spores being present, that could be black rot. But um, when, when you see that grayish brown fuzzy uh, sporulation, um, that tips you off, this is actually botrytis that you're dealing with. And here again, with the lighting there, it looks a little white. So you might think, oh, that could be powdery mildew or down mildew. Uh, but especially in the bottom right there, we can see how brown that is. Um, and of course, um, for me, it, uh, you can do a microscopic slide of that and the spores are uh, quite different in their morphology compared to downy mildew or powdery mildew. 
Um, so botrytis is really going to, again, it's going to really need uh, that relative humidity. So you can remove the leaves around clusters. Um, something I should point out, though, is <clears throat> when you're opening up those uh, grape clusters, you do want to also keep in mind the potential for sun scald. You don't want to open them up so much that they, uh, that they uh, burn up in the sun. So there's kind of a happy median there. Um, you can use fungicides if you've had a history of the disease. Um, you want to apply those at bloom. And um, again, uh, I think that's a typo there. Um, again, uh, before harvest. And so there's some listed there that are um, available and effective, but again, uh, both the, um, the timing of the spray and the products are all in that fruit um, management guide. Um, I do want to say one other thing about botrytis that I didn't have explicitly stated here. So the best way, if you ever have botrytis, the best thing you can do is just harvest your grapes in a timely manner. Um, if the grapes are ripe and sitting on the vine, that is ideal for botrytis. Uh, but if you just harvest your, um, your fruit uh, when it's ready to be harvest, harvested, um, that's going to go a long way, most of the way, to managing uh, botrytis infection. Okay, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but because I have talked about um, situations where you might want to apply fungicides, I have to do my due diligence as an extension <laughs> uh, specialist and just mention um, some best uh, practices when you're going to spray. So again, always mix the product and spray according to the label. Use protective, uh, correct protective, uh, personal protective equipment, which will differ based on the formulation of the product. Don't randomly mix fungicides um, unless they're specifically listed as um, compatible, they could precipitate out, which could cause them to be completely ineffective. Or you could get phytotoxicity if the uh, solvents and adjuvants are not um, going to play nice with the plant. Um, the mixture of those together could strip the cuticle and cause a lot of injury to the plant. Not necessarily the active ingredient, but the other things that are in there. Also, more is not better and pick the right um, time of the day. Um, I apologize if you've taken the uh, training with Andrew Thornstenston, but uh, you know the temperature, if it's too hot, because you'll know all of this is why I'm apologizing, but um, if it's too hot, those adjuvants can damage the plant even if they are listed as safe for the plant. Uh, if it's really windy, you know your fungicide might not be getting where it needs to go. Uh, you never want to apply fungicides right before it rains because they could be washed off where they have a chance to get into the plant's tissues or set. Um, even the protectants that don't go into plant tissues do kind of cure. I almost think of it like a paint, you know, your paint, you don't want to paint right before it rains. You also don't want to apply fungicides. Um, and then the stage of plant growth and where you're at with the disease. If you already have a lot of disease pressure, um, you're not going to want to uh, apply a protectant, for example, because it's not going to do much for you. Um, so this is that fabled uh, Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide that I've been mentioning. Um, this is the current episode, 2019 to 2020. Here's a link where it is available. Um, since the uh, talk is available for you online, um, you now have access to that link. But you could also just do a quick search, Purdue Midwest Fruit Guide, and you'll find it uh, right away. Um, just quickly going to mention viruses, mostly just so you're aware of, you know, hey, could this be a virus? Uh, viruses are a lot trickier to uh, manage and even to diagnose because they're sub-microscopic. Um, but there are several viruses that can affect grapevines, including um, tobacco ring spot, tomato ring spot, um, a grape leaf roll virus, uh, and several others. Um, unfortunately, viruses can be highly variable. Uh, they will express themselves differently based on the overall health of the plant and also cultivar interactions with um, if the genetic differences of the cultivar could impact the expression of the virus. <clears throat> also, just depending on the overall health of the plant, they could be latent or symptomless. Uh, but oftentimes, overall, the plant's going to be stunted. It's going to have reduced vigor, uh, which is going to lead to poor fruit quality. And then if the virus does express itself um, beyond just the stunting and reduced vigor, it often has discoloration or distortion in foliage that could be confused with a nutrient disorder or a herbicide uh, drift. 
So here we have grape family virus, um, and you can see the vein banding, um, which is also uh, associated with um, several nutrient disorders. Um, so what can you do to prevent um, a virus? Because really what we're trying to do with viruses is just prevent them. Once you have a virus, uh, you're going to probably think about re removing that plant and replacing it as opposed to treating it with fungicides um, as is an option for those other diseases I talked about. Um, so high quality planting stocks should have had a, a virus um, indexing program uh, where they certified it as virus free. Um, so that'll go a long way. Uh, don't introduce the virus with your purchase, right? Um, likewise, not propagating new plant tissue yourself or using sock from a friend or another grower that where you don't know much about um, the history of that plant is going to help prevent viruses. Um, testing is available. I can test for viruses, um, but we have to use either a protein or a nucleic acid-based test. You can't just pop it under the microscope like a fungus. Um, I have to buy third-party vendors' supplies to do that, so I do have to charge for that test. Uh, so it can be pretty expensive, um, especially if you're just doing it for one single plant. You can get into the hundreds of dollars quite easily. I mean, if we're lucky and it's the first, the first virus we test for, um, most people would probably be okay paying for that. But sometimes you have to test it for ten or twelve viruses to narrow down what you're working, uh, what you're working with, and and nobody usually uh, wants to spend that much money. Um, and then there's no realistic cure or treatment either. But the reasons you might think about testing are, can, well, it's always nice to know if you do have a virus or not. And while negative data can't ever prove that you don't have a virus, it can certainly support that you don't. Um, and also, uh, different viruses have different methods of transmission. So it could shed some light into maybe some things that you're doing or some arthropod tests you might need to manage as many viruses are vectored by different insects. Um, to help alleviate that virus and prevent it in your uh, vineyard in the future. Uh, and then there's lots of, um, lots of issues that you might see on grapes that aren't going to be related to a pathogen of any kind. Um, so obviously herbicide injury, here we have a picture of a grape <coughs> that's expressing symptoms of coming into contact with a growth regulator herbicide of uh, phenoxy. Um, it causes those fingerings, other Growth regulator herbicides like 2,4-D will cause the leaf to pucker and the petiole to twist. Um, and the dicamba just causes crazy amounts of puckering. Um, that's usually what you'll see on grapes. Um, maybe some Roundup here and there too, um, unless you're right next to an agricultural field uh, and then they spray all kinds, of <laughs> all kinds of things and it can get a lot more complicated. Um, so I just want to touch real quick on arthropod pests. I am not an entomologist. Uh, I do have an entomologist that works in the lab though, and he would just be absolutely thrilled to help you if you ever had uh, an entomologically related uh, problem on your grape or any other plant, um, or even if you just need help identifying an insect that you find in your home. Um, I asked him, you know, what are, what are the big things, the big entomologically related problems that uh, they should know about before growing grapes. And this is the short list that he gave me. Um, I will show a photo of the gall midges, but not until later when I compare them to phylloxera. And I also do not talk about spotted wings or sophla because Esther McGinnis and Jan Canodal have a lot of programming out there about spotted wings or sophla. Um, again, Alex, who works in my lab, can identify spotted wings or sophla for you. Um, and he would be happy to answer any questions. But I also, you could, uh, there's several fact sheets and um, I would imagine recorded podcasts and other um, sources for Drosophila. Likewise with Japanese beetles, um, the one thing I am going to share with you with Japanese beetles is just the latest uh, trapping results. Uh, the North Dakota Department of Ag does um, partner with uh, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service to, <clears throat> with the USDA to trap. Um, each year since um, Japanese beetle was first detected, I think in 2016 or maybe 15, not sure. Um, all, every county had at least one trap. You can see poor little dung. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess Billings, Slope, and Bowman and Golden Valley did not have any. Okay, well, most counties had at least one trap. Um, 
but only the ones that are dark blue had any positives. And then even out of that, they could have had a shading um, if they wanted to, a shading scale, but they chose not to. But CAS, for example, had 42 of the 85 traps come up positive for Japanese beetle, whereas uh, Burley only had eight out of 65. So we're looking at 50% roughly of the traps being positive in CAS and uh, about uh, one eighth of the traps being positive in Burley. So there are differences in scale maybe of the infection rates. Um, the idea is though, if you're in one of these counties or a neighboring county, you could see Japanese beetle um, if you don't know much about Japanese beetle, the danger will come from the fact that the adults are voracious feeders. They will feed on just about everything, not just your grape plants, um, but they will feed on grape plants as well. Uh, potato leaf hoppers are really cool. Um, I've had a number of samples come in where the submitter thought that there was some kind of herbicide injury. Uh, you can see the rightmost photo there shows puckering and distorted foliage, almost like a uh, dicamba or 2,4-D combination. Um, and then we see these necrotic margins. Um, if you look at the underside of the leaf on those necrotic margins, you'll see the, our little friends there on the left. Um, so you can see both a nymph and an adult of the potato leaf hopper. And so as they feed on the um, plant tissue with their piercing sucking mouth parts, um, they inject some of their saliva in there and it has a protein that for whatever reason causes the plants to uh, distort as though they've been ex exposed to a growth regulator as well as turn necrotic. Um, and they're, they're somewhat easy to uh, see. Um, you can probably see them with a hand lens um, <clears throat> if you just look on the underside of the leaves. And then that, if you see those, then you can say, oh, okay, that's almost certainly what's going on. Uh, phylloxera is, um, again, I'm no expert to this, but what I was uh, told I should share with you is that European rootstocks are going to die if they get these aphid-like creatures, but on the plus side, nobody really uses European rootstock anymore, um, especially up here where um, most of the releases are fairly new to, to uh, focus on cold hardiness. Um, so for management, there are resistant cultivars available and you can remove galled tissues as those galls, um, that's where the uh, insect goes to lay eggs, where it can lay, uh, if I recall right, 400 to 600 eggs in each gall. But it's gonna be impossible to eradicate even if you were to remove all of the galled tissue on your plant uh, because some number of them always remain down in the roots. But you can lower the end season pressure on a plant. And so uh, there's a source here for phyll phylloxera that I uh, listed um, through Oregon State. Um, it was overwhelming for me as a, someone who's not an entomologist. I, I certainly didn't want to read that much, but if I was going to grow grapes and had any issues with phylloxera, I would read it because I, it was about 15 to 20 pages long, very thorough, very in-depth, just absolutely great. Uh, resource for information on that. And on the leaves, um, as I mentioned with the gall midges, uh, there are lots of different uh, gall midges and even other uh, insects that can cause galls on grapes, um, but phylloxera is somewhat um, unique. Uh, it'll cause that chlorosis on the top of the leaf as well, and then its gall is just highly characteristic. It's very spiny, lots of ornamentation. So if we look closely at phylloxera there on the left, uh, versus two other types of galls uh, on the right. Um, you know, sure, there are other things that can cause galls, but they don't look anything like phylloxera. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of uh, non-phylloxera gall-making insects that can create galls that will um, form directly on the fruit even. Um, but if it's not for table grapes, you can actually still use that fruit. And uh, the galls on the leaf tissue uh, are really just ornamental. They don't result in a lower um, quality fruit. They don't kill the leaves. They're just kind of there. Um, so no controls are recommended for the, uh, the non-phylloxera gall-making insects. Very, very briefly, I'm gonna talk about cultivar selection guide because um, this information and much more is in that link, which I 
suspect is the same link that Julie Robinson um, mentioned uh, before I started my talk. Uh, but when you do choose grapes, um, there's three different varieties, um, or well, three different types, I should say, of grapes. If you're growing them for juicing, and you can make uh, jellies and jams out of the juice. If you're growing them for table grapes, or that just means you're eating the, the fruit, right? Uh, that's what we buy at the store in the produce section or table grapes, or if you're growing them for the purposes of wine. Um, and then in general, it's easiest to grow the juice grapes and the wine grapes are the most difficult. Um, mostly because uh, any slight differences in cultivation, like soil type, soil fertility, water stress, uh, that's gonna drastically change the flavor of that wine. Which if you enjoy wine, you know that's why certain years are so sought after and others are quite cheap. Um, when you're looking at uh, site selection or you're thinking about starting a vineyard, uh, in general, you plant your dormant rootstock at the end of May. Um, but the site selection and microclimate of where you're planting that rootstock is very important. I'll touch on that very briefly at the next slide. Once you plant that rootstock in May, you should see some green material being produced as early as June. Um, and you're gonna space those uh, in rows. The rows are gonna be eight foot apart from each other and the plants are gonna be six foot apart inside of the rows. The rows ideally should be oriented north to south. And then you're gonna wanna put down uh, some mulch and weed control um, within one and a half foot on each side of the plant or a three foot diameter circle. Um, could go farther if you want, but that's the minimum recommended. Then you uh, will wanna think about constructing a trellis for the <clears throat> vine to train up um, on July or later of that same year. But you don't wanna do any pruning of the plant until the next year, and you won't um, get a harvest until the earliest, the third year. Uh, for your site selection, it helps if and Grant Fargo is flatter than a pancake, right? But there are hills in other places in North Dakota. Um, so ideally your vineyard would be on a slope. That slope will allow colder air to drain off uh, and away from the uh, site. Um, so on the left-hand side where those green stakes are, that's supposed to represent your vineyard. And that's what you want ideally. On the right-hand side, the vineyard is on a slope, but that um, windbreak is actually going to trap that cold air, so just uh, indicates how ideally you'd uh, you'd have that um, air being unimpeded in its flow to the lower portion of the valley. Um, so that was a whole lot of topics, um, very minimally touched on some of them. Um, there are a lot of different resources out there for you if you do decide to grow grapes. Um, we do have a, a uh, state extension specialist who um, is a high value crop specialist. I'm sorry, I'm, she's not with extension, but she is a high value crop specialist, Carlene Hatterman Valenti in Plant Sciences. Um, and she's an excellent resource if you have any questions about cultivar selection or uh, tips on how to grow. Um, and, and she has a lot of talks that she gives and um, if you think you have an issue with uh, any kind of a pathogen, or nutrient disorder or anything like that, um, I'm a great resource for you. Um, so I, again, work in the Plant Diagnostic Lab. That link is to our staff page. It has our contact information, um, where you'll find, of course, myself, Jesse Ostrander, as well as my assistant, Presley Mosher. Uh, we can help you out with plant pathogens and other plant disorders. And then again, Alexander Knudsen, um, he is the entomologist, uh, and he part, he's, um, also works under Jan Canodal uh, with regards to his entomological um, specialty. Um, that Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide is gonna be awesome um, on uh, information related to fungicide applications and other chemical applications. And if you really get into growing grapes, um, I would recommend you get the Grape Compendia. The American Phytopathological Society has compendia for, you know, just about everything from wheat to potatoes to grapes to cherries um, to cucurbits. Uh, but the grape one is going to be, it's going to be costly. Um, last I checked, they were like $190, but it's incredibly thorough. Beautiful pictures. Um, and it covers everything from basic, um, you know, the basics that I kind of already touched on as far as uh, what to expect with regards to cultivation. Uh, but it'll also go into 
all the different pathogens from fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes. It'll talk about um, herbicide injury. It'll talk about um, all the entomological pests of economic concern. And it will also touch on um, nutrient disorders. So it's an incredible resource um, that you would most likely use several times a year um, for many decades if you were to invest in it. Um, so with that, um, I will be happy to try and answer your questions. And um, if I remember right, Julie, you were, were you planning on I, reading them back to me? Because I didn't monitor that at all. I will be reading them back. And first, I want to thank you for giving us this very informative webinar and thank all of you for joining. So you have four questions. What if you want to do totally organic growing and you don't want to use any chemicals at all? So that may or may not be realistic. Um, you can always aim for that. If you do aim for that, uh, like I had mentioned, um, for insect pests, there you would then want to use like organic um, products that are wouldn't violate the organic certification, like uh, mineral oils or things like that. Um, certainly for powdery mildew, um, I'm not an expert offhand at what is available and what isn't available for organic. Uh, but I do believe that the sulfur and potassium salt don't violate that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if black rat's killing your plant, you're going to have to use an organic, inorganic, or you're going to have to do something else, like start a new site <laughs> or something along those lines. And that's why organic produce costs more. It is not always successful and it takes a lot more input. Um, you might have to be out there several times a day, removing material, um, that could act as a, a source for canidia. Um, and then you might still be able to get some harvestable fruit. But certainly the inputs go way up and your resources are limited. Okay, your next question. Um, this comes from Diane who says her husband is Lebanese and he loves eating rolled grape leaves stuffed with ground meat. Are there any varieties of grapes that have bigger leaves? Oh, I, I do not know that question. Um, I would ask Harlene that and I'd be happy to get you her contact information if you need help with that. Um, you can just email me and I'll get you in touch with her. All right, when is the best time to prune? Um, so basically the pruning is going to occur um, so with a lot of path, with a lot of tree uh, woody species, it's best to prune um, when the plant is dormant to prevent secondary infection. But with grapes, um, if you're going to prune to prevent these diseases, that's just going to be an activity that is ongoing as you see problem areas where foliage is um, denser uh, than it should be. And uh, that density is, you're just going to develop a comfort level with that over time. But the idea is, Obviously, you want the vine to have enough leaves on it that it can uh, adequately photosynthesize, but you also don't want it to be um, too, too closed off that air can't move through it. So you're going to want to open it up a little bit so you can kind of see within it, but not necessarily that it looks bare. I don't know how to describe it better than that. <laughs> All right, and then uh, Jennifer makes a comment you can all read if you're looking at the chat box. Um, she planted grapes for the first time and she found King of the North, Valiant, Beta, Bluebell, Swenson Seedless, all working well. So but just oh, a tip yeah. from, from Jennifer in East Grand Forks. And finally, Nikki says we have three varieties of grapes. We don't know which of them, what they are, since we just bought our property. Some of them are red, some blue colored, and some green. Any ideas? And she lives in central North Dakota. Yeah, that, that would be tough. Um, I would again suggest you ask Carlene, but uh, I don't want to set you, your expectations too high. Um, that's pretty difficult to identify a variety if you have no background information on it. Um, and I get that request with potatoes, for example, and there's, there's one lab in the United States that can uh, test uh, unknown um, potato varieties. So I would imagine the, the level of difficulty would be similar, if not worse, on grapes since the, the overall um, commodity 
is is less in terms of economic dollars than than potatoes. So, um, yeah, I, I would ask Carlene. There might be some characteristics where she could at least let you know what type of grape it is, um, table versus juice versus wine. But yeah, that that would be very difficult. And with that, I will draw us to a close. And I want to thank Jesse again for sharing his knowledge with us and all of you for participating. And we hope that you look at the archive webinars if you missed any of them. Last week, Janet Canoto, who was mentioned today, did a beautiful job on one about butterfly gardening. So brighten your day if you want to watch that. And then join us next week about pollinators and the following week on coronavirus with me and food safety. So thank you again, and thanks, Jesse, and I will stop the recording.